Welcome to the Myopia Podcast. My name is Dave Caden. We're going to be speaking about uh, the low concentration atropine for the myopia progression, not just the provision, study that can be continuation versus the washout. Optometric Invest Insights in Media promotion. proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you again for joining us. I'm excited to speak with you today on a recent study that came out in 2022 that is called the three-year clinical trial of low concentration atropine for myopia progression, the LAMP study, continuation versus washout. This is the phase three report of the LAMP study. The original report uh, was just a one-year report um, talking about, uh, I believe, 438 children aged four to 12 years old. In this particular study, it was a total of 350 of those children and um, uh, the children were randomized into a subgroup at the three-year time point to continue the concentration that they were in or to wash out of the concentration. And what we really wanted to see is were the children's effect lasting or was there a huge rebound effect and people that stopped taking the drop just dropped down substantially. I thought this was really interesting. They both looked at both the spherical equivalent as well as the axial length data. And uh, a total of um, 326 children completed the three-year follow-up. And uh, it was kind of an interesting. So to, to give you some perspective of, of what was really looked at here, is they, they wanted to know uh, how, how different concentrations would affect people, uh, children with myopia. So they, they originally selected uh, almost 440 students. They had a placebo group. They had a 0.01% atropine, a 0.025% atropine, and a 0.05% atropine. Each of those groups had about the same. And then they looked at the data in phase one after a 12-month follow-up. And then the second phase was a 24-month follow-up. And inter interestingly, the placebo group uh, at that point was switched over to a 0.05%. So they had gone one year without any treatment. And then in their second, they switched over into this, uh, this a higher concentration. And then at the beginning of phase three, the group that had started as a placebo continued with their concentration the groups that had started with the other concentrations, 0 0.05, 0 0.025, 0.01, half of them switched into a uh, no treatment and then the other half continued the treatment. So in the end, we have really uh, seven different groups, 0.05% that stayed on the treatment the entire study, 0.05% that washed out after two years, and so forth for the 0 0.025, 0 0.01, and then the placebo group who had gone without treatment and then had been switched into 0.05%. And the things that we're looking at here uh, was how the effect on spherical equivalent and the axial length changed uh, for the subjects. So that was really the, the outcome that we were evaluating and uh, in, it, it, they were evaluating in the study. And uh, some interesting data kind of comes out about this. And I can really uh, you know, speak to some of the graphs that they have in the chart and kind of tell you the, the overall consensus that we see here is the group that had been in the placebo group for the first year showed the fastest and the most spherical equivalent change to both the axial length group as well as to the spherical equivalent. 
And uh, that was compared to 0.01%, 0.02%, uh, 25%, and 0.05%. And at that one year time period, we see a considerable improvement for the 0.05% compared to both the spherical equivalent as well as the axial length uh, for these groups. Now, uh, recall at the 12 month time period as they started phase two, the placebo group switched over to being 0.05%. And so what we see on these graphs is this placebo group show considerable reduction in, uh, in or increase in myopia and increase in axial length. And then at the 12 month time period, there is a dramatic change and we see that they slow down considerably in their progression. And by 36 months, uh, the uh, the placebo group, you know, shows for considerably less progression than some of the even uh, lower concentrations, even though they started later on to the atropine. The, the overall consensus here is that the group that showed the most consistent reduction in spherical equivalent across the time periods at 36 months was the group that was in the 0.05% that continued treatment the entire time. And that stands for both spherical equivalent as well as axial length. And then the next group that showed the next at the three year time period was the group who started off in the 0.05% and then washed out after two years. At the three year time period, that, that group still showed the best improvement uh, compared to all of the other concentrations. But the slope of that line appears that had the study continued, that that group would have uh, been surpassed by the group who had not been treated the first year, but then been treated at 0.05% after one year. So those, those uh, lines uh, get really close to each other at the three-year time period and at a potential four-year time period, if these slopes of these lines continue, it would have been better to have not been on atropine at one year changed over than, and, and not have uh, used it, then have to have gone 24 months using it and then have stopped. I don't think that's really where we should be thinking about, but the consensus I take away from this is if I haven't done atropine on the patient, the sooner I start them, the better. And the other takeaway that we have from this is that the highest concentration, the 0.05%, yields the greatest reduction in spherical equivalent compared to the other treatment groups and uh, that with washout, they still are showing a considerable improvement comparatively to the other, uh, other uh, concentrations. Now I wanna talk a little bit more about this uh, kind of rebound effect after the washout. And the uh, concern about a rebound effect was certainly highlighted in the ADAM-1 and ADAM-2, the ADAM-2 study that were put out. And um, this rebounding effect of, uh, of what happens. And um, the, the, the reality is that yes, these, these patients do end up becoming more myopic after they stop it. But one of the key components that needs to be discussed is the children's age. Uh, they found that the older the subject's age, the smaller the rebound effect uh, really was. And uh, obviously, myopia progresses less in older children. So that's something that needs to be uh, certainly taken into uh, account is uh, if you have a young child who is on a treatment and then you stop it and you see that there is, you know, more, more progression at that point in a young children, you would anticipate that regardless of the treatment that the patient had. So that is a reality that is, uh, is, is, is something to keep in mind. 
The other thing is that all of the concentrations in the studies were pretty well tolerated. Uh, sometimes the thought is with the higher concentration, we may not, you know, be able, the, the children may not be able to tolerate it. Both the Adam and the Lamp studies uh, really had a population um, subgroup uh, that, uh, you know, had darkly pigmented eyes. There may be a racial variation in sensitivity um, because of the pigmentation with the iris. Uh, the East Asian uh, subgroup was, was a, a vast majority of these patients. And so non-Asian children uh, likely will have a different effect, uh, possibly in treatment as well as the, uh, the side effects. Um, however, uh, in this particular group, there was a pupil size increase uh, of about uh, one millimeter, 0.97 millimeters in the 0.05%, a increase of 0.45 in the 0.025%, and a little bit larger, actually, in the 0.01% of 0.61 millimeters. And the study references a, uh, a study that was a European study um, that uh, showed that even at higher concentrations of atropine of being a 0.5%, not 0.05, but 0.5, um, the uh, ch children uh, who are at risk of developing high myopia um, you know, can, can deal with that. There was a 22% of the children who stopped doing the treatment because of um, the side effects. But in this phase three, at three years, they found that across the, the, the uh, subgroups that were washed out, um, the pupil size, accommodation, um, regardless of the concentration, um, their amplitude of accommodation and so forth, return to baseline um, within the first four month visit that they saw. And that shows that even after two years of using a treatment, you know, the child's amplitude of accommodation appears to be about the same and the madriasis and so forth is reversible as well. And, uh, you know, to, to reference um, uh, another study that they're highlighting in this particular publication is um, photopic pupil size of more than three millimeters is uh, kind of that, that the, the significant for discomfort. And these patients, you know, at most had a one millimeter in the 0.05%. Now, from my clinical experience, we have had some patients who have struggled with 0.05%. It's not a substantial percentage and kind of shows us in our practice that uh, because it's not a high, high prevalence for our patients, we usually end up going to that higher concentration initially and then see if there is a side effect profile because we can always back it off if we want to especially for children who are in more fast progressing. So, you know, my takeaway from this study is, is a couple of things. Number one is it appears the importance of utilizing a higher concentration of 0.05% appears to be a more effective way of slowing the progression of myopia down if it can be used. Uh, number two is that the side effect profile seems to be pretty good. Now that it was in East Asians, uh, and so if you have a, um, a, a large subgroup of just blue-eyed individuals, you would need to be uh, more carefully monitoring the amplitude of accommodation as well as their pupil size to see if it's something that bothers the child. Using your topographer or using another device, you can gather what that pupil change is with those patients that are using it, um, as long as your lighting is similar in those situations. Um, and you may want to look at both scotopic and photopic, mesopic uh, pupil size for your patients. Number three is that even after washout, um, you know, there still is a, a, a beneficial effect of having been on the treatment for uh, several years. 
Um, I think that the, you lose that, obviously, the longer you've been washed out, but certainly appears to be that going on to treatment with atropine, especially during the years that are the fastest progressing, uh, appear to be a really good way to go since those children, um, although they did progress uh, a little bit more, those children do show um, you know, the greater need for myopia management. So that's my take on the LAMP study. I think this is uh, really showing us that going to the highest concentration possible may have some beneficial effects to our patient. Um, this makes me feel more comfortable on the tolerability um, and the ability of that higher concentration, uh, something we've been doing in our clinical practice, just going to the highest concentration and then uh, managing the, um, the effects. Uh, but it seems to be that this is uh, showing us that it's a safe and effective way to go about it. I'd love to hear your perspectives. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's some things in this article that I missed or misspoke on. I'd, I'd love to hear your perspectives. Uh, you can leave a comment or contact me on any of the social channels at Dave Kading. Um, and uh, let's see what, uh, what we can learn from each other. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.